Well, I've been here for 11 years. We pack it, so I'm still here, so it's a great room. Back in the day, I worked at Motown Studio A, is about two miles from here, and now I'm working here, and I still go to the museum and play sometimes, so I've traveled two miles in my career. Yeah, I was there every day, so I did Cloud Nine, Just My Imagination, Psychedelic Shack, Someday We'll Be Together, Nitty Gritty with Gladys, it just went on and on. Norman Whitfield came in with an arrangement of a song on Cloud Nine, and I had a wah-wah pedal. He says, that's it. So in two weeks, I was backing up the Temptations in the studio on that record, and then I was there all the time. Check it out. Yeah, here. Early on, Dennis Coffey tried collecting the records he played on, like J.J. Barnes, The Shades of Blue, Jamie Coe, The Volumes, a whole lot of Northern Soul back before his Motown days. Oh, yeah, These things yeah. probably worth a lot of money. These. Yeah, they are. One time I sold a record for $1,400, and then I stopped selling them. I, was just, I just keep them. In the 50s, in high school, they called him the rock and roll kid. You know how it worked is we were kids learning how to play rock and roll and everything came under that umbrella. Jimmy Reed and the blues and B.B. King and T-Bone Walker, all that stuff, and Chuck Berry, who was the master at that stuff. You know, So all that stuff fell under that top 40 umbrella. And I started doing blues and I started doing rockabilly. When I was 14 at McKenzie High School. I had my rockabilly guitar and I'm doing blue suede shoes and singing it at an assembly and the kids are going nuts. And I got to tell you, this spinster teacher thought it was too suggestive, and she pulled the plug on my amplifier before I could get done. I thought that was kind of, you know, that was not good. You know, but hey, what are you going to do? That's the first record I ever played on. I'm Gone by Vic Gallon. WEXL was a country station that played country and western and rockabilly and, and, and don't forget uh, Sun Records came out, Elvis Presley was rockabilly and you had Johnny Cash and all those guys, Roy Oberson, all those guys were coming out, uh, out of Sun Records with rockabilly and that's where we started to hear it. If you listen to the Vic Gallon record you'll hear me, hear me doing a rockabilly solo at the age of 15. Wow, you get paid for playing music. This is pretty cool. We did a session called Crazy Little Satellite about the satellite. And so we actually recorded that record at United Sound, and Barry Gordy was the arranger on that session. The record didn't come out in a year, so we were only like still, I don't know, 16 or 17. So I says, well, obviously this record business isn't happening, so I just told them I, I wanted out of my contract and I wasn't interested in the record business anymore. So <laughs> they gave us back our contract and the record never did come out. I don't think Barry probably even knows to this day that that's where I first met him. Once I graduated from high school, I, I volunteered for the draft. So uh, I was right out of McKenzie and I volunteered for the Airborne. Being Airborne is crazy anyways. They give you combat pay for jumping on the planes. Jimi Hendrix was in 101st when I was in there. I didn't really meet him, but the guys took his guitar and hit it and wouldn't give it back, and he got real upset. My buddy Bob, who played rhythm guitar for me in the 101st, uh, he cut up a guy in a bar fight, so he had to join the Army or go to prison. So uh, people were not too interested in trying to hide our guitars because of him. I get back, still only 20 years old, so now I'm playing six nights a week and making a good living doing music. Back in those days, you could work six nights a week in a club and make a living at it. And then I was a member of the Royal Tones and we were signed to Harry Balk's label. Del Shannon was one of his artists, so, so I played on Handyman with Del Shannon, a Little Town Flirt, all that stuff. Del Shannon told me that the Beatles used to open up for him in England. 
As the British invaded, Coffee played on, joining recording partner Mike Theodore. They became record producers, all while Coffee worked at Motown as a freelance funk brother. Coffee and Theodore produced Rare Earth's first album. See this guy right here? That's me, because their guitar player got lost on the way to the picture, so I put on sunglasses and got in there. They also produced Rod Regan. He's my most memorable artist. The searching for Sugar Man Rodriguez. And we always believed in Rodriguez. I mean, he really, that Cole Fact album is still a masterpiece. It really it still rings true. Everything that he sings about in that album is still true today, which shows you how far we've come as a society with zero. We haven't done anything. If you listen to the Cole Fact album right now, it still sounds like today. Around that time, Coffee put out a record of his own. This was the very first one. An LP and a single. This is It's Your Thing, you know, the first instrumental I had out. Then it's Coffee and the Lyman Woodard Trio. It didn't sell like the Isley Brothers version. Coffee had to wait a couple years. It was 1971. This is uh, the evolution. Album. Now for Dennis Coffee, the Detroit guitar band, and Scorpio Coco. That's me jumping off a building, almost sprained my ankle. Forgot to do a parachute landing for him. And I said, well, you know what? What if I write some songs and I'm gonna make it like a guitar band and I'm gonna have guitars doing horns and string parts? And I went in the studio and uh, Scorpio was one of the songs and, so, and that whole thing just, just took off but it took a year before that was a hit. It's been said Scorpio's breakbeat would help lay the foundation for the hip-hop sound. Once Motown left, there were no sessions here anymore. I mean, there was nothing here for, for me to make extra money doing that. I said, you know, maybe this is the time for us to go out to L.A. because I always wanted to do a movie. Black Belt Joe. I lost three of my best men in there. Black Bell Jones, yeah. It's a karate guy. And, a uh, combo of black exploitation and karate? It was. It certainly was, yeah. Enter Jim Dragon Kelly. I was in L.A. for three years, from 73 to 76, and I got up one day and I said, you know what, I don't even like it out here. It's not fun for me. I'm a Detroit guy. Detroit is just, it's my vibe. Back in the midst of a recession, Coffee had a tough decision to make. I went to work on the assembly line at General Motors. Someone realized who the new hire was. Worried the guitarist's hands could be ruined, he moved Coffee to a less dangerous job. Coffee went to college, became an expert on the lean manufacturing process, and he trained the people running the assembly lines. I made a good living at it. Coffee kept playing and recording, too. Can you get the other stuff, Dave? All right. My mom's family was very musical, so I had the talent, but I just didn't, it, it, I had to practice. I used to practice eight hours a day. I still practice all the time. Dennis can play anything. He is just amazing. So we've been down to hear him at Northern Lights, and you know, there isn't anything he can't do. And when he came out with this kind of a new genre that fits into our schedule, we thought it'd be great to have him. Play. Coffee's put together a combo for the Greater Detroit Jazz Society at the Shields Restaurant in Southfield. Jerry McKenzie played with Stan Kenton, Ray Teeny with Paul Anka. That's Dave Tatro on trumpet, Scott Gwinnell at the keyboard. These guys know every tune, every style, and it's just a blast to play with every one of them. We're playing more contemporary jazz, so I mean, it's not the far out avant-garde type jazz. It's just straight ahead American songbook that we're doing in there. To be able to play with the master, I get to check that off my bucket list and, you know, and hopefully do some more of these gigs because it's thrilling to play with the uh, a legend. For a six-string instrument, I'm still a student in the instrument. I'm still studying. I saw Segovia play by himself at 92. For six strings, there's a lot of possibilities left yet. 
you know, on the guitar.